I'm going to read two verses. First Corinthians chapter number two. Begin reading in verse number nine. The Bible says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, it's just going to give you a heads up. It's one of them that it's going to take us a while to figure out what Brother Jordan was thinking and try and explain that to you before we can actually get to the thought. But, Brother Ray, verse number 9 says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Then verse number 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So verse number 9 says, Ain't nobody ever seen, ain't nobody ever heard, or nobody's even dreamed up within the heart of man that hadn't even entered into the heart of man what God has gone to prepare for them that love him. Then verse number 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. You go read the book of Revelation, John the Revelator called up into heaven. Right? He gives us, with the limited vocabulary that we have, compared to what heaven's going to look like, he did his best. Now, I believe that there's 12 foundations. He said one of them's, you know, a different precious gem. Now, does that mean that each one of them is made of that? Or is that the closest thing that John had a reference of to tell us what it actually looked like? Now, I believe that there's 12 gates and they're made out of, you know, giant pearls. Right? Single pearl. Each gate. Right? He said the streets of pure gold. Right? Then you get to them sections where it starts describing what Jesus looked like. I believe he's just limited in what he could use to relay to us. He says, hair was white. Well, how white? Well, it was, it was as white as it could be. White as wool. Well, what is it? Well, it kind of looked like brass, but it wasn't brass. But brass is as good as I can get to explain what it was like. So what's the Apostle Paul saying here in verse number 10? He said, the Spirit's revealed unto us a little bit. And he says, but it's beyond anything in your wildest dreams. Okay, so let's go back to verse number 9. This is where we're going to be dealing with the majority of the thought but as it is written I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him notice he didn't say the place that God hath prepared he didn't say the you know environment of what he's gone to prepare he doesn't say that you know the atmosphere no he says the things plural one of them things. That's everything that he went to create. That's everything that he went to go prepare. Right? So keep in mind, he's not just saying, oh, heaven's going to be beautiful because of its architecture. No, heaven, just heaven in general, you can't even imagine what it's going to be like. Right? Well, he says, as I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man things which God has prepared for them that love me. You know what prepared means? It's made just for you. Prepared means that you knew what the outcome needed to be, so you made sure that it came out that way to meet the need or to meet the end result. Right? You don't prepare something that you just throw together. Right? If you prepare something, you put a lot of effort in, you did a lot of planning beforehand so that it came out the way that you knew it needed to be. Right, well, talking about those things, we're talking about new, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, right? Old earth gone away. We're talking about all them things that we just get, you know, a glimpse of through the Word. But one of these days is going to be made reality for all of eternity. He says, I have not seen nor ear heard. Now think about that. But right, I haven't been to a lot of places, but I've been some places. Been to a few of them Caribbean islands. They're beautiful. 
right? Great scenery. They they may hike one time out through the rainforest down there in Puerto Rico. You could say, well, was it beautiful? Not in the moment, because I was angry that they dragged me out there in flip-flops and made me hike all the way through this rainforest. I'm like, we did not have the shoes required to go on this trek today, but yet y'all wanted to go climbing up waterfalls or something. Right? But retrospectively, yeah, it was a beautiful rainforest. Right? I've seen some neat architecture throughout the years. I mean, those of y'all that know, did a little bit of traveling for debate back in high school and college. I've seen a whole bunch of college campuses where all that money that they charge them kids goes to building buildings. Right, probably the most beautiful campus I've ever seen was Emory University down there in Decatur, Georgia. Even the new buildings that they built today, they make them to match the ones that they did back then. What's that mean? They got all marble exterior and they got copper roofing on them. Right, you walk out on that quad and you're thinking, wow, we someplace special. Right, white buildings, copper roof. And you say, well, what about, I've been to, been to Vegas. I've seen all them crazy contraptions that they call hotels with funky angles on them and different design schemes and using different ways to build this and to build that. Well, you say, I've seen a whole lot of what the heart of man can dream up and make into, I mean, objectively beautiful things. But see, we got this thing called the Internet. I've never been to France, but guess what? I've seen photos of the Eiffel Tower. You know what the impressive thing about that was? They did that one all by hand. Very little machinery. That's still staying in today. I mean, I've seen photos of the Empire State, but never been to New York. Don't want to go to New York. Too many people in New York. I don't get along with people. Right, but I could see all them buildings. They got that one over in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, they called the Burj Khalifa or whatever it is, tallest building. But the way that they had to make that thing so that it could be that tall and with the wind not fall over. That is it's a work of art. I've read after the you know, ancient the wonders of the ancient world, right? The the lighthouse at Alexandria. Right? Different things throughout ancient history. Then the modern one, you know, I mean, talk about the pyramids, talk about Colosseum. Right, things that were done with just brick mortar and hands that even today you're like, wow, that's pretty impressive. But what are you saying? We've, we've got access to a whole bunch of what man came up with. Right, even where I went to, down there at Western, they got a building called Cherry Hall. It's up at the top of the hill, it's the one that they put in all the commercials. You know what they got? It's all marble on the outside, all the floors and the stairs and everything else, marble on the inside. Got big domes everywhere, got a big statue of Mr. Cherry out in front of it. But it's, like, it's made to impress. Right, let's, uh, let's go with just one step further. Right, those are things that we've seen. Right, there are things that we haven't seen, but I've heard about. That I'm pretty sure it'd be pretty impressive. Well, saying, there's this place out in the middle of the desert called Area 51. I'm sure that it's pretty impressive. But what are they doing over there? They're testing airplanes. Right? I don't believe that ET's in a bunker over yonder. Right? They just got a whole bunch of super secret stuff that goes really fast in the air, and I want to figure out what it is. Right? But never been to Fort Knox. Building's not all that impressive. It's what's supposed to be inside the building. Right? All that gold that would be impressive. Right, but all these things that man's seen, man's heard about. I've watched a whole bunch of movies, but Tommy, I've, I've got Star Wars almost committed to memory, except the new three that they came out with. We haven't watched those enough yet to, don't want to watch those enough to commit those to memory. But, but he's saying, I've seen what people think spaceships look like. I've seen what other people think that, you know, if there were other planets out there that we could live on, what they'd look like. Right? I've seen enough Marvel movies to know that, you know, hey, people think that if there was some ancient alien planet where all the people were green or something, right, that this is what that planet would look like. What do you say? I've seen a whole lot of creativity. But yet, according to verse number 9, doesn't matter what you can dream up. Right? What God's gone to prepare will outdo all those expectations 
all those dreams, all those alternate realities that people have come up with, going to put them all to shame. But see, those are things that I've seen, that I've heard about. Notice, verse number 9, he doesn't say that our eyes haven't seen. He's talking about all mankind from Adam up until Jesus comes back. But what's that mean? You see, when Noah got off the ark, everything was different than it used to be. But we do know, according to your Bible, not according to Brother Jordan, right? We know that Abraham at one point, him and Lot, their herdsmen were having disagreements, so they decided one's going to go this way, one's going to go that way, so that the herdsmen aren't in a fight, and so that uncle and nephew weren't at odds with one another because they loved each other. Well, the Bible says that Lot looked at the plains of the city. And according to your Bible, it called it, and he said, it's just as fruitful as the garden of God. But I only find that God made one garden, that was Eden. What are you saying? Lot looked down at the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, and to his eyes, Lot thought that that looks just as beautiful and as fruitful as the garden of Eden. Well, after that, we get into some of the things that people see. Entered into the heart of it. I don't know what David intended for the temple of God to end up as, but I do know what Solomon was able to build by a description. What do you think? It's the most spectacular and beautiful building that's ever been built by human hands. Done for one purpose, to bring honor and glory unto God. The inside of that thing was almost solid gold. Go read it. Got the exterior of it. Best materials. Interior, all the support structures. Cedar trees brought from a very long distance away because they were known for their durability and their beauty. Right? All the precious gems that went into it. What do you say? People saw that building. So as beautiful as Solomon's temple was, doesn't even come close, according to verse number 9. But say, let's go one step further. That's everybody after Noah. I had not seen, ear, had not heard. Hadn't entered into the heart of man. Well, what about before Noah? Well, we can go all the way back. Adam and Eve, they knew what the garden looked like. Adam and Eve knew what it was to not be cursed by sin. You know what that means? Well, we know that it meant that God walked with them in the cool of the day. But see, Adam didn't have this veil like the Apostle Paul called it where we can't see the spiritual realm. Adam could look up. He could see into heaven. He said, where are you going with this, Brother Jordan? I'm saying new heaven and new earth going to put current heaven to shame because Adam saw it. What does number nine say? I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man. Was Adam a man? Adam knew in his heart what heaven looked like. What's that mean? That new heaven and new earth going to outdo current heaven. As much as Adam knew, he knew the garden. He, he knew the world before sin. He knew what it was to fellowship with God in the flesh. Here's voice. And as much as Adam could dream in his wildest dreams that one day God would redeem man and he'd go and prepare a place for him. Guess what verse number 9 means? The heaven that Adam did see, the heaven that John the Revelator saw when he was called up into the third heaven where all the judgments were going on, new heaven and new earth going to put that one to shame. Can't even compare. Doesn't hold a candle to it. What are you saying? I'm saying what he's going to prepare is something special. Now keep in mind, why did God make new heaven and new earth? Because the old one was cursed by sin. But also it's a place for those that love him. End of verse number 9. Who are those that love him? Those that put their faith and trust into Jesus Christ. So, those that are saved 
Right by this point, they've been birthed into the family of God, adopted into the family, married into the family. New heaven and new earth going to come down. What's the point in new heaven and new earth? Where God's people that he bought with the blood of Jesus, that he adopted, right, that he birthed into the family, that he married into the family, Amen. will forevermore be in his presence and be able to fellowship with him. Why did he make current heaven and earth? Well, current heaven, I don't know why he made that. I just know that his thrones in the sides of the north, that's his domain. Uh, we don't learn nothing about that. Why did he make earth? Because God wanted to. Amen. Right? Well, why did he make new heaven and new earth? Because God wanted a better place than heaven and earth for those that put their faith in his darling son to be able to fellowship and to be with him for all of eternity. Didn't Jesus say that if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You know what the point of new heaven and earth is? To get us to where God is for forevermore. That we'd be where he was. That where I am, you may be there also. It's a place of no separation. It's a place of no divide. Well, you say, if there's new heaven, there's new earth, there's new Jerusalem, how can we never be separated? Because we're going to have a body like his. I mean, God's omnipresent, is he not? He's all-knowing also. He knows exactly where you are, no matter what you're doing. Right? He sees you as if he was standing in front of you, wherever you are. The Bible says that when we pray, it's as if we enter into the very throne room of God. Well, wherever you are, God sees you as if he's just right in front of him. He hears them thoughts just as if he was... They were the thoughts that he would have had. Why? Because he's a part of you. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, what's the point of new heaven and new earth? We're going to have a body like wherever it is that we's at. It's going to be as if we're right in front of God the whole time. But then also, we could be physically in his presence. You say, what's that mean, Brother Jordan? I don't know. It's a, it's a place that I can't even, hadn't even entered into the heart of man. I'm just saying, it's going to be great. That, that's the point that we're trying to get to. Right? As much as we've seen as many of the places as we've gone, many of the crazy movies as we've seen where people have dreamed up paradises and put them on TV screens, doesn't matter. Doesn't even compare to old heaven, let alone new heaven. Adam knew what heaven looked like. Well, what's new heaven, new earth, that place that he's gone to prepare look like? I don't know, but it outdoes old heaven. Because it entered into the heart of man what old heaven was. Adam beheld it. He saw it. Not well. We've hit on what it's going to be. What it's going to be? I don't know, but it's going to be great. Not well. We've already quoted the verse to you. Right? Jesus said that if he go, he would come again. Why? Right? So that where he is, we may be there also. For all of eternity. And again, he used the same word over there in the book of John that, he did, that the Apostle Paul used here in verse number 9. It says that God hath prepared for them that love him. Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you. Think that's coincidence? No. It's designed just for you and just for me. But you do realize that your conversation's already recorded there? You say, well, it doesn't exist yet. Well, it says that Jesus went to prepare it. So he's working on it. And when it's finished, that's when the father's going to say, hey, go get your bride. He's preparing it for the last person that's ever going to trust him. But keep in mind this too. He's also preparing it for all them saints that come out of the great tribulation. But he's saying he's omniscient. He knows who's going to be there. Right? He's preparing it. Why? So that it's a place for you and a place for me. Heaven was made for God. That's his domain. You know what new heaven and new earth are made for? For God and you. Because he prepared it for you. That where he is, you can be there also. 
I'm saying it's a wonderful, beautiful place. Hey, I'm talking about y'all look like I just shot your dog. We're talking about heaven. Right? But on top of heaven, we get over there. He says that where I am there, you may be also. We get to fellowship with Jesus Christ in the flesh. We get to see him as he is. We get to hear his audible voice. What's it sound like? Well, I believe it sounds like a voice, sound of many rushing waters. Well, what's that sound like? We'll figure out when we get to heaven. Right? That's the best we got to compare it to right now. What's his eyes look like? Like flaming fire. Right? Well, what's that mean? We'll figure it out one day. He's the light of the city. No matter where you go, guess what? You got a perfect view of Jesus. That way, well, maybe all them houses that he built for us, maybe they're made out of pure gold too. Why you say that? Because you can see through it. Right? But if everything in heaven is made out of pure gold, guess what that means? No matter where you are, you can see through it and see Jesus. He's the light of the city. So you got chapter and verse on that? No, I'm just speculating now. This is theology according to Brother Jordan. What are you saying? I know it's going to be beautiful. No, it's beyond anything that we can imagine. But I still can't get over this. The book of Revelation tells us how big the city is this way, how big the city is that way. And then it says that the wall is this tall. And then it says that the city is this tall. I can't wrap my... What's that mean? Is it all big? Is it like built on a mountain? I don't know. Is it built like a whole bunch of apartments? Just like the Colosseum built all the way around so that everybody got a view of Jesus? I don't know. John saw it, but he, God didn't tell him to explain it. I just know that the wall is this tall and the city's taller than the wall is. Right? And as high as it is, I think it's about as high as Boeing airplane jets fly. Okay? What do you say? I still can't figure out what it's going to, you know, what it's even shaped like, let alone what it's going to look like, what it's going to be like. What is that? But it's going to be good. Right? But as good as it's going to look, as good of a place as it is, it's going to be. The thing is, all of what heaven's going to look like and be like, that's just to show you how much God loves you. Because he made that for a place that you could be there. But you know why he made you a place to show you how much he loves you? Because he wanted you to be there with him. The true joy of heaven isn't going to be the place that's got our name on it. Because in truth, it's not going to have our name on it. It's going to say Jesus gave this to that person. Why? Because he bought it, he paid for it, he built it. He's just saying, I, I made it for you. Right? The true joy of heaven is that where he is, we will be. Forevermore, all eternity. I, I know y'all right now, but after we get done eating and feeding our faces here this afternoon, guess what's going to happen? We're going to leave. I'm going to be someplace. We're on the same spinning ball out in the middle of the you know, space. We may be in the same Kroger and not even know it. Right? But can you imagine that throughout all of heaven, all new earth, all the new Jerusalem, no matter where you go, you're with Christ all the time. You say, how that's how that work? I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. But I believe it because he said that where he is, we would be there also. No separation, not just in the flesh, no separation at all. That you are always with Christ for all of eternity. Now we say, that's a whole bunch of good stuff. Right? Thinking about that kind of stuff is what gets me through hard days. Right? Gets me through days where I feel like saying, you know, Lord, I just don't know if I can go another step. I can go another step because I know what's waiting for me on the other side. Not just waiting on me in the material. I know who's waiting for me on the other side. But see, we know what he's gone to pre prepare. We know what it is. What's that? That's a place for us to be. What's it going to be like? Still haven't figured that out yet. All right, we're not going to know this side of heaven. Right? But I do know that he's gone to prepare a place. And as much as he may have gone to prepare a place for you, guess what? He's gone to prepare a place for me. It's personal. I'm not shouting on what Brother Brian's going to get in heaven. He prepared a place for me. Just like he prepared a place for him. But, but then the person that we get to see. 
we get to be with him I'm not stuck with you in heaven for all of eternity. I get to be with him I'm not going to care about you you say well brother Jordan that may be a little harsh we're going to be known as we were known I'm going to know who it is hey nice to meet you but I'm here to see him now it's all about him you say well that may not be screwed everywhere we go we can see him he's the light of the city I may just be happy with talking with Jesus for all of eternity I don't care who's in the I'm going to shout regardless of who's in the building so why would I care who's in heaven I'm just going to shout and carry on but, but all of that right, we've got something beautiful waiting on us We've got a person that's all together lovely. He's a prince of peace. He is love, according to your Bible. He went and he's crafted with all of his omnipotence, all of his all power. He's gone to prepare a place that you can't even dream about how great a place it is. About what it's going to be like. Let alone to know what it is to be in the presence of God and to never be separated. That he said that he could be a friend that sticks closer to than a brother. Why? Because he broke fellowship with the Father on Calvary to pay for our sin debt. And he promised us we'd never have to know what that was like. Well, for all of eternity, it's not a spiritual connection. It'll be physical. He promised wherever I am, you're going to be there. Right? We know that the Bible is convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Well, once new heaven, new earth comes along, nothing can separate us from the presence of God. But then, you know what he's going to prepare. We know what he's envisioning for us when we get there. If your job, but Phil, I know where Brother Phil works because I work the same place. Brother Phil, if Mazak came to you and said, Brother Phil, we're only going to ask you one time, but if you hold up to your end of the deal, we're going to double your salary next year. Give you a bonus that's equal to what you was going to make anyway. All you got to do is do this, 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 and this. Be there on time. Never be late. Be five minutes early every day. When we ask you to work overtime, don't even hesitate. Just say yes. Right? They give you a list of like ten things to do. There's people in this room that break their neck in order to make sure they kept all ten of them things. Like, as they know what's waiting on them at the end. They'd be motivated to get, but well, it's, it's a free, it's not just free paycheck, it's double your income for a year. One lump sum payment of whatever your annual salary is. People break their neck to do it. They'd change the way that they live their life in order to make sure that they could fulfill all of them things that the boss may ask you to do. They'd cut other things out of their life to make sure that they could do those ten things that the boss wanted to do. And what, at the end of it, what is it? Wood ain't stubble. Can't take it with you. What are you going to do? Well, I, I tell you what Brother Jordan do. Brother Jordan buy more Star Wars stuff with it. That ain't going to help nobody. <laughs> right? Right? I'd go out and, you know, put a bigger engine in that charger that I've got and probably kill myself. Right? I know exactly what I'd do with it. What is it? It's all wood, and stubble. Right? Even if we were to, well, I would give all the, I'd donate it all to charity. Right? Honestly, I'd love to give it to all the missionaries we got on that board up there. Especially with, you know, in a post-COVID world, where some of them still fighting to deal with that, let alone fighting the devil, fighting tooth and nail to go out and take the gospel to people that have never heard it before. Right? I'd love to do that. But in truth, God don't want me to have it. I'm not going to have it. But let's get back to the point. The point is, is that if the opportunity was there, some people kill themselves to make sure that they get it. But you know what he's going to prepare for you? More than anything that you can even fathom. He gives you just little, little morsels, some breadcrumbs of what it's going to be like. Well, it's going to be a beautiful city. 
It's got 12 foundations. But we're talking about the... In our, we're talking about the gravel and the blacktop that are out there in the parking lot. That's what them foundations in heaven are going to be. That's just the gravel, big gravel, fine gravel, right foundation level, base layer. Then we get the footers in. Then we get all the... What are you saying? That's just what God built the city on. And we're all talking about jasper and diamond and all the... What are you saying? That's just God's concrete. We're all excited about the foundation because we can't wrap our head around what the city's actually going to be like. He's just saying it's so special that he used the most precious stuff down here as the concrete to build it up there. And yet so many people will just walk around defeated. I get it. Life's hard. But the true joy is that one day I'll be where he is and nothing can separate me. Right now, nothing can separate me from the love of God. But I'm talking eyes, seeing His eyes. Ears hearing His voice. If I could reach out and touch Him, I'll get to bow at His feet, praise Him in a body that isn't limited by what sins caused it to be cursed with. But I'll be able to worship it more than just in spirit and in truth. I'll be able to worship him in actuality as he deserves to be worshipped. Right? These are things that we get to look forward to. I get it. He said, take up your cross and follow him. It's a burden. But Jesus took his cross. Yeah, we got a little bit of time left. Jesus took his cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him. He didn't enjoy laying down on that cross and having them drive them nails through his hands. But you know why he did it? Because of the joy that was waiting on the other side of the cross. He knew he'd have to break fellowship with the Father. He knew that the sin of all mankind would be laid upon him as our sacrificial lamb so that his spotless and pure blood could atone for all that sin. He knew that it was going to be a horrible experience. But yet he did it anyway. Why? Because he knew of the goodness that was waiting on the other side. The joy that was set before him. I've asked this question before. You know why women, knowing ahead of time, all the horror stories about how bad childbirth can be. Why they still choose to have kids? Because of the joy of having a kid. They deal with all the nine months of the cramps and the pain and the kicking Right, and the craving pickles at 3 a.m. in the morning for some unknown reason. Right, they deal with all the hot flights, the mood swings, with the fact that their ankles feel like they're going to pop about every day. Right, some of them put on bed rest, not allowed to move, get out of bed. Right, all because of what? Because of a child. But yet, this is. I may get in trouble for this, but Tommy. Okay. As bad as all the horror stories that I've heard about, it can't be that bad. Why? Because some of y'all got two and three kids running around. If it's that bad, you'd have stopped at one. <laughs> right? Am I saying it's not bad? No. I'm not saying it's not bad. I'm just saying that you thought that it wasn't as bad, right, as is good of having a kid. Right now, I know. Cutting up, but in truth. As bad as the cross was, Jesus saw how good it would be for you to get into the family of God and he embraced the pain because of the joy that was set before him. Right? Women know ahead of time, it's going to be bad, but in nine months it's going to be worth it. So why do we as Christians not have the ability to say, yeah, it's bad right now. But for the joy that's set before us, what's that? For the place that he's going to prepare... Some of us, and we're not even going to break it down, right? Every now and then we get a little bit of heaven around here. Right? right? Just a little glimpse, a little inkling. That's enough to keep me coming. Sure. Keep me going. That's what I look forward to. We're not even talking about, you know, all of eternity. Right, Brother, Brother Ray? I get within eight songs, Brother Ray. You're going to be singing about heaven on Sunday nights. Why? Because he believes that he's going. And he can't wait to get there. Right? He's looking forward to it. 
I mean, y'all do realize that you join heirs to his throne. You do realize everything that he owns, you own? Well, what's he, well, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. You know what that means? You own a cattle on a thousand hills. Maybe not in this life, but definitely in the next. And since you're a joint heir, you know what that means? That if you need it, God will give it to you. Now we're talking about needs. We talk, Not even needs. We're talking about wants most of the time. He's pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. We got more than we know what to do with. We had so many of us walk around with our heads, right, like ostriches in the ground. Don't look at me. I feel awful. Right, today has been so bad. But has it been worse than Calvary? Because he embraced that willingly. Why? For the joy that was set before him. We've got something so good, our heads can't even wrap around how good it's going to be. And I get it. We're, we're human. We're flesh. The Apostle Paul himself said that, oh, wretched man that I am. Right? He knew the things that he still did after he got saved, and he said, Lord, I'm, I'm not worthy for the powder. It'd take a blow away now, let alone what it was before you saved me. But what he keep his eyes set on? What he would be in Christ. He knew that he is wretched today. Why? Because this sin cursed flesh. But he also knew what God put in him and what God promised he would make him into. What's that? Just like his son. I have a body like his, fashion like his. Right? Outside of our personality and our identity, because us being known as we were known, you can't tell us a diff tell us apart from Christ in heaven. It's only the knowledge that God gives us that when we look at somebody, we'd be like, oh, hey, that's Brother Phil. Right? Oh, hey, that's Brother Clint. Or that over there, that's Joseph of Arimathea. What are you saying? I know just a little bit of the joy that's set before us. And just that little bit that I know causes my mind to start melting when I start thinking about it. Like, we've got more than joy set before us. We've got all of eternity. Yeah, today's bad. But one bad day in the scope of all of eternity. Right? The worst day that you've had. Job, you know what he said? God gives, God takes away. God's still God. He said, I know what God's prepared for those that love him. And it's a whole lot better than anything that I've had a taste of down here. So he said, I'm just going to keep serving God. The worst day that Job ever had didn't change the love that he had for God. Didn't change the devotion he had towards God. And it didn't change the determination to live as thus saith the Lord. Well, how are we tossed about with every wind of doctrine? How are we carried to and fro on the seas of doubt? Doubt is a sin. Because without faith, it's impossible to please them. What's the opposite of faith? Doubt. You know what that does? With doubt, there's nothing you can do to please God. We doubt, we question. Now questioning ain't wrong as long as you get the right answer and get it settled in your heart and keep going. But all the things that we deal with, we've got a joy that's set before us that you can't even begin to understand. Right? Imagine that the kid that gets what he's been asking for all year on Christmas and he has a panic attack, right? And he's running around the house hooping and hollering because he opened up the present and it was what he wanted it to be. Right? Take that amount of joy and excitement Right? And then sticking in somebody like Brother Phil. Get up, running laps, hooping and hollering. Right? All that excitement that we had, it hadn't even entered into the heart of man. Well, God's going to prepare. What do you mean? When you get there, you're going to act crazier than that? How do you know that? Because I've read how loud it gets in heaven in the book of Revelation. It's too loud for just one person to be happy. Right? It's too loud for just a couple of people to be, get excited about what God did over there in, in glory. But you know what I do know it's going to be? It's going to be perfect. It's going to be sinless. It's going to be a place that He prepared out of love for you. Specifically for you. Well, how, how do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because I believe that if only one would have believed 
that Jesus would have gone to the cross. You know what that means? The place he prepared for you in heaven, it's a place that if only you had believed on him for dying on Calvary, he still would have made it for you. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. You know what? He's gone to prepare a place to show you how much he really loves you. On top of all that he does to prove his love to us, he said, I'm going to go prepare a place because I know I'll be there. I want them to be there. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm going to come back and get them. Well, that place that he's prepared, I hath not seen. That includes Adam who saw old heaven. Includes Noah when he got off the ark and he saw what God remade earth into a second time. Can't imagine what that looked like, but you know what I, you know what I know? Noah knew what it looked like. That doesn't compare. That lot who saw all them cities on the plain, he said it looked like the Garden of God, Garden of Eden. But you know what? Lot knew what that looked like. Heaven going to be better than that. We went through all the things that I've seen, let alone everything that everything else in this room seen. All the beauty of nature, beauty of the work of man's hands. How beautiful Solomon's temple was. And guess what? Not even a drop in the bucket on what he's going to prepare for you. Remember that the next time you're feeling a little bogged down. Next time devil starts telling you that you're nothing, Jesus thinks you're pretty something. Because he went to prepare a place for you that's unlike anything that's ever been created before. How can you say that? Because it's not going to be like old heaven or else he would have kept old heaven. Not going to be like old earth because he's going to destroy that one. He's going to make new, new earth. Going to make new Jerusalem. Amen. All for the express purpose of showing you how much he loved you and to make sure that there's a place that you can be separated from him from, for all of eternity. We've got a joy that's set before us. Right? Just every now and then ask God to remind you how great it's going to be to be over there. If you've got your eyes on the finish line, it don't matter what's between you and the finish line, you're going to get to it. It's when you start looking at your feet and what you're stuck in that you feel like giving up. But if you see what's waiting on the other side, the joy that's set before us, it's a whole lot harder to quit a whole lot easier to take your foot out of the mud and to get back on the track and keep on running. It's easier to get up and dust yourself off when you fall. Because you don't see where you're at now. You're going to see what you will be on the other side. Yeah, we're flawed. We're imperfect. We still sin. But one day we won't. One day we'll be as He is. And you know what that means? We'll be able to worship Him as He deserves. He said, there's a great joy set before us. Too many Christians have forgotten that. Because Jesus, because of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. So how much more could we endure as Christians if we knew the joy that was set before us? Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.